Well, thank you, um, everybody, for coming. Um, and I am a statistical geneticist studying uh, the molecular genetics of addiction. And so what that means is basically I am looking through the genome for genes and genetic variants that confer risk for alcohol use and other substance use disorders. And so I'm going to start just talking a little bit about how we do that. This is, of course, DNA. Um, and you have the sugar phosphate backbone and then the nucleotide bases, thymine and adenine, cytosine and guanine. And this, there are three billion of these base pairs in the human genome, okay? 99.8% of that doesn't differ between people. But if we look at 0.1% of three billion, that's three, still three million differences between any two individuals. And when we look at like the population level, that translates to about 10 million differences that we can see in a population. Um, and my job is basically to go through those and figure out which ones might increase ever so slightly, as Dr. Messing nicely pointed out multiple times, um, risk for addiction. Um, <clears throat> because we think these differences combined with the environment is what makes us all unique, right? So how do we do that? Genome-wide association studies tend to be the, the standard at this point in time. Um, we start with a saliva sample. Uh, we extract the DNA, apply it to a microarray uh, micro that looks just like this. Um, and within a day, we can generate genotypes at about seven and a half to as many as 10 million variants based all across the genome, okay? And <clears throat> We, uh, we do a very simple test. We basically ask, if we look at one variant, um, is a certain allele uh, occurring at a higher frequency? In my case population, individuals with alcohol use disorder uh, contrasted with our control population, those without a disorder. And we do this one at a time for every seven and a half million of them, okay? Because of this, to claim that anything is significant, we have to do a huge correction for multiple testing. People have determined that there's about a, a million independent tests, given that markers close by one another are correlated. So we have a p-value of five times 10 to the minus eight, um, which is required to claim genome-wide significance, which means, uh, which is a very, very small number. <laughs> okay, um, and <clears throat> That by itself is problematic, and as Dr. Messing pointed out in his talk, uh, alcohol and other substance use disorders are highly complex in terms of their genetic architecture. There is no addiction gene. There's not even a small pool of, you know, like 20 addiction genes. There are literally hundreds, if not a thousand genes in the, out of the 20,000 that make up the human genome that are going to be relevant to a complex trait like uh, uh, alcohol use disorder. And if we look at any one of those individual differences, it's gonna explain less than half a percent, uh, half a percent, um, typically 0.2 to 0.3 percent of the variation in the trait we're looking at. So this is a really tiny effect and really has no, you know, has no meaningful uh, impact on how anyone would lead their life um, when we look at it by itself. Now we combine these tiny effects with the number of variants that we're looking at and to find anything that has a genome-wide significant effect on the trait that we're looking at, we honestly need sample sizes of upwards of 100,000 people, um, sometimes even larger than that, okay? <clears throat> and that's the, that's the approach we've taken. Okay, now obviously no one person could collect that many samples by themselves, so these are huge consortia-driven efforts um, in the United States and around the world, um, but this kind of, Collaborative science has made, led to significant progress in identifying novel genes related to psychological traits. Um, so uh, one of the biggest success stories is uh, with schizophrenia, um, led by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, where they've, they've um, actually more recently, like somewhere around 160 different genes related to, or genetic loci related to schizophrenia. They've managed to do similar things to look at educational attainment I believe the highest grade you achieve um, in, in your educational history, um, and, and also depression and, and neuroticism. So where are we with addiction? Well, for alcohol use disorders, so this is a paper that I was involved in, this is what's called a Manhattan plot. On the x-axis, you have the chromosome, 
And on the y-axis, you have the negative log 10 of the p-values. Now, higher values are more significant. Um, and we had, in this paper, one significant hit. This is ADH1B, which Dr. Messing also talked about in terms of alcohol metabolism. It's not at all exciting, because this was first reported 25 years ago just in the Canada gene literature. But what is exciting is if we look now at larger samples. Now, this, isn't, this is disordered alcohol use. Down here, we just have daily alcohol consumption. And this is a, a, a large study that had 500,000 participants, and now you're getting something that actually starts to look like the Manhattan skyline, which is where the name comes from with these different towers, this bar being genome-wide significant. And now we're actually starting to identify novel variants. So this big giant peak over here is actually the MAP-T gene, the tau gene, um, that's been related to multiple neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and on chromosome 11 here, you got DRD2, um, like the Robert Downey Jr. in terms of like redemption stories for Canada genes. Um, so I was pretty excited to see it there. Um, and ADH1B over here. Okay, so we're making progress. And you know, as Dr. Messing pointed out, these have tiny effect sizes. So in terms of intervention, drug targeting, um, you know, it's hard to know which ones to go after. But I would also point out like DRD2 here also pops up for schizophrenia. Tiny effect size, two tenths of a percent, but it has a huge, you know, antipsychotics target directly the DRT-D2 receptor and have huge effects in terms of their uh, clinical implications. So the, the small effect sizes don't necessarily translate into the impact, the potential impact in terms of a drug. All right, so this is one half of the story and how we're using DWAS data to identify novel genetic, uh, novel genes that can for risk for these disorders. Now, I'm a psychologist by training, so I'm also kind of interested in other ways we can use genetic data. And so one way we're doing this is through the use of what we call polygenic risk scores. So I can take those data from that alcohol consumption GWAS that I just showed you, and then I can collect your saliva sample, okay? And I can pick out the, variant, the very first variant, and I can say, like, check how many alleles do you have that are associated with increased drinking? I multiply that by the correlation with the trait, and I put that in a little, you know, in a little box, and then I do that for the second variant and the third variant. I add these all together, and I can get a measure of your aggregate risk for heavy drinking <laughs> in this way. And then I can see how much does that predict in an independent population, your, how much you're going to be drinking. And actually, from that study that I showed you, they were able to predict 7% of the variation in al daily alcohol consumption in a completely independent sample, which is a lot more than two-tenths of a percent. And we can use that in really interesting ways. And in fact, in other fields, people are already arguing that we need to start using polygenic risk factors, risk scores, to make clinical and, uh, treatment decisions. And so this, was paper, uh, paper, this news story was inspired by a paper from the Broad Institute looking at cardiac disease, diabetes, um, and breast cancer. But as we collect these bigger samples and apply that to substance use disorders, we will be able to do the same thing for addiction. Okay, now we could collect these, you know, we could create these scores for alcohol use dependence disorder. I'd say that's kind of only one of the interesting ways we can use that, right? We've heard a lot that um, uh, substance use disorders are multifactorial in ter terms of their causal factors, right? Um, and so, you know, we can maybe parse and find more refined phenotypes and then use that in a treatment and prevention setting. So we could look at substance metabolism or sensitivity to alcohol executive functioning or in person, uh, you know, aspects of personality. The other thing I would point out is that, you know, addiction is a process, right? And so when we're looking at prevention, and uh, genetic, you know, the genetic risk factors for prevention may be very different from those in terms of treatment. And so we can develop risk scores that could be useful and inform treatment at different stages of addiction and substance use. Okay. Um, in my lab, I'm particularly interested in sensitivity to alcohol, um, and um, we are kind of in the early stages of, of, of conducting these types of GWAS. Um, we have around 10,000 participants in our samples at this point, with, um, and are in the process of, of uh, cleaning data where we'll be able to get our numbers up to around 30 to 40,000 individuals. So we're on the road to this, you know, um, on this path. And, you know, my, my kind of my hope is at some point what we'll be able to do 
is develop a risk score in terms of someone's sensitivity to alcohol and use that in prevention efforts, right? And tell people, you know, this is, this is how sensitive you might be to alcohol. And, you, and then also tell them how that relates to the onset of addiction, right? So most of us probably think being able to drink is a good thing, right? A drink a lot is a good thing. And in fact, a lot of people, particularly um, younger individuals, pride themselves on how much they can drink. And countries like Australia. And so, um, you know, we can educate them that that's not necessarily always a positive, and that that specific risk could, you know, be something that they should pay attention to. Okay, um, so I'll sum up there um, that, you know, like we've said before, genetic variants um, are of small effect by themselves. That being said, that identifying what the genes are that are, in, you know, critical and involved in the etiology of addiction-related phenotypes will help inform novel drug development um, or drug repositioning. Uh, and <clears throat> The use of polygenic risk scores can be, you know, has great potential in terms of both prevention and, and treatment efforts going forward. So I only had 10 minutes, so I think I made it. Um, I want to thank all of my um, collaborators, and there's actually some on there, including Bruce Bartholo, um, that I should acknowledge um, that have made all this work possible. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to the next presenter, Dr. Slutsky.